Welcome to the 3C Live Experience, a dynamic, multiracial, fast-growing church with thousands of believers filled with passion for God and for people. Let's join 3C in this live experience. So last week, we were looking at Proverbs 11 verse 30, which says what? It says, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. Why are you wise? Because when you take your eyes off yourself and your own needs, your eyes are then lifted. When your eyes are on yourself, your eyes are always down, which means that when your eyes are down, you don't have vision. Yes. The Bible says, Proverbs 29, 18, he says, without vision, he says, my people perish. They run wild. They are, they are unrestrained if you don't have vision. So if your eyes are in the sand and the mud and it's maintenance and just getting by, it says, no, wise people, they lift up their eyes. They lift up their eyes and they see others. They see the needs of others. They see the, the issues in others so that we can be a blessing and help without being condescending, full of ourselves, thinking that we're better than anybody else. That's not what it is, but rather having a love and compassion for people, they are not there as the machinery to serve us. Can I get a big amen there? Amen. We are there to be a blessing to them. And that's why we saw it's important that we need to, that we need to uh, win souls, touch people's lives, share, our, share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. Now today, I want us to look at Luke chapter 14 and verse 16. Luke 14 and 16, I'm reading from the new uh, King James Version. Then he said to them, a certain man gave a great supper and invited many. He, he gave a great supper, a great celebration, a great party. And he invited many to this party. And he sent a servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, come now, all things are ready. Verse 18, but they all with one accord began to make excuses. Say with me, excuses. excuses. Okay. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of land. I must go see it. I ask you, have me excused. Verse 19 says, another said, I've bought five yoke of oxen and I am going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Verse 20 says, still another said, I have married a wife. I beg your pardon. <laughs> I've married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to the master and then the master of the house being angry. What was his emotional state? Angry. One of anger. He then said to the servant, he said, okay, now go out quickly into the streets, the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor, the maim, the lame and the blind. Verse 22, the servant said, master, it's done as you commanded and there's still room. The master then said to the servant, go out to the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. Say with me, that my house may be filled. My house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. You shall not taste of the joy of the celebration, of the goodness, the freedom, the joy. You shall not taste it. So if I go back and we analyze and we understand the scripture, we read about the certain man, which is a representative, which represents God himself in this parable. And we see that he is having a great supper, a party. And he invited many to this party. And hence, 
The title of my message today is Don't Miss the Party. Say with me, don't miss the party. Bump your neighbor. Say, neighbor, don't miss the party. So, no, neighbor, seriously now. Seriously, don't miss the party. And then secondly, don't come alone. Bump your neighbor and say, neighbor, don't miss it and don't come alone. Seriously, don't come alone. So that's the title of the message. And here we see that he has a party, not, he's here as a host, not a judge. He's here, God is usually portrayed as the heavenly police that's waiting for you to do something wrong so that he can punish you and fine you. No, you're invited to a party, not a prison. Life in the kingdom is a celebration. It's a life of joy, peace, purpose, fulfillment. It's eternal life. And it's way better than the parties you get in the world. Which usually end with hangovers, regrets, shameful conduct, stupidity, ultimate death. Bump your day and say, this is not going where I expected it. <laughs> Some of you this morning, you hear from that hangover from last night. Hence, you're in the 10 o'clock service and not the 8 o'clock service. No, 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 sorry. Ah, no, no, no. I'm teasing, I'm teasing. That's not right. That's not right. I'm glad that you are here. You're in church. Amen. Amen. I'm glad you didn't use your hangover as an excuse. Oh, I'm sorry. Amen. <laughs> teasing, teasing. You know what's interesting is that the same excuses they used 2,000 years ago in the Bible, they still use the same excuses today. It's exactly the same. And if we analyze the excuses that people use not to go to church, not to serve the Lord, and, well, we're specifically looking at Easter, say me, Easter, which is a public holiday, not a vacation. Holiday comes from the term holy day. That's when you talk about holy day is a holy day. Vacation is where you go away. A holy day is where we come together as a church and celebrate the holiness of God. And Easter. What happens on Easter? What's Easter about? No, it's not a bunny. It's a celebration of the death of and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why the government has given us this as a public holiday. It's a religious holiday. It's a day where we come together. And what better way to celebrate it than bringing somebody that doesn't know Jesus? Inviting somebody to the party, amen? But we see they all alike began to make excuses. And let's look at the first excuse. The first excuse, they said, well, I have bought, I have bought a piece of ground. I must go and I've got to see it. This is during church time. I ask you to have me excused. The number one thing I've seen when it comes to people is possessions can be their excuse. And even many times the lack thereof, the lack of the possessions. But possessions can be an excuse. Why not getting to God? Suddenly you got stuff. It takes time to maintain stuff. The more stuff you have, the more time it takes. And now you have to cut the grass on a Sunday. Clean the car on a Sunday. Do your maintenance on a Sunday at a time you didn't have a grass. Some of you still don't have grass. <laughs> Come on, somebody. At a time you didn't have a car. Are you hearing me? Sorry, pastor. Can't make it this weekend. Got to go off, go see the family. Going to Lampopo.
Hello. When you just got saved, it took you three taxis to get to church. Some of you walked. Did you use your feet, take an hour to walk to get to church. Come on, somebody. You didn't have a car. Now God has blessed you with a job. God has blessed you with a car. Come on, somebody. God has blessed your life. And now suddenly you don't have time because of the stuff that God originally gave you. You didn't have a car to drive to Limpopo or to KZN. Come on, somebody, wherever you need to go or go away, go and leave. You didn't have anything. You didn't have a holiday home. You didn't have the money to be able to go away. You went just, I don't know, at a picnic in your front yard. Are you hearing me? So it's easy to get caught up in that place. Your personal possessions can be an excuse. The second thing we see is that he says, I have now five yoke of oxen and I need to go test them, see if they work. I ask you to have me excuse. The second thing I see people use is their work. At a time you didn't have a job. Or you prayed and God gave you a promotion. But now suddenly, pastor, we can't be there. Why? I have to. I have to work. But you haven't even gone and asked to get leave. You haven't even made the effort. You haven't trusted the Lord. And what happens is we use our excuse and we use our business and we think that's okay. So we think those are legitimate excuses. But although they seem like legitimate excuses, it doesn't fly with God. Because at the end of the day, is God number one in your life? The third excuse people use is their family. Oh, pastor, I can't. You know my, you, you, you know my wife. You know my wife, but your wife doesn't even know you're using her as an excuse. Or you know my, my, my husband, oh, you know, he's not really a church guy or whatever, but you know, your husband doesn't even know you're using him as an excuse. Or my parents, sure, my parents, or my, or my, or my, 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 my children. How stupid must you be to use your kids as an excuse for not serving the Lord? How stupid to curse your own children. God gave them to you as a blessing and now you use them as an excuse not to serve him. Are you hearing me here today? Is this in the Bible? Yes, it's in the Bible, written 2,000 years ago. And it's exactly the same issues we have today. Is God number one within your life? Or are we going to make excuses? Bump your neighbor. Say, neighbor, don't miss the party. <laughs> say, say, neighbor, seriously. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, especially after this word. Especially, don't you? Yo, God help you. Yarra, help you. Are you hearing me? No, 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 don't miss the party. Don't miss the party. So with all those excuses, my question is, what is your excuse? What is your excuse for not serving the Lord? What is your excuse for not going to church? What is your excuse to not fulfill the mandate and purpose of God within your life? Well, pastor, I don't have time. How stupid to tell the person that determines your time, dude, I don't have time. Woo, we bury you tomorrow. Do you see how ludicrous that is? So either you really don't believe in God or you don't respect and honor or fear God whatsoever. Surely the God who owns time has the ability to make sure you have time. Can I get a big amen there? And that's why when people say they don't have time, I know they're not serving the Lord because when you serve the Lord, God helps you that you always have 
time. Can I get a big amen there? Amen. And I was, I was reading an interesting article the other day. <laughs> and they gave reasons why people don't serve the Lord. Pe- reasons why, why people don't go to church. The, the top 10 reasons we use. Why not going to church? Why not serving the Lord? But what they did, instead of saying not going to church, they said, they said um, why I never wash. So why I never go to church, they said, okay, let's, let's, let's swap it with something. Why I never wash? Why I never bath? Excuse number one. The reason why I never wash is because I was forced to wash as a child. Pastor, that's why I don't go to church, because I was forced to go to church when I was a child. Other people say, well, Pastor, I don't go to church. Why? Because my parents never forced me to go to church. People who wash are hypocrites. They think they're cleaner than others. There are so many kinds of soap, I couldn't decide which one was right. Number four, I used to wash, but it got boring. I only wash on Christmas and Easter. Why I don't wash? None of my friends wash. Or I'll start washing when I'm older. Or I really don't have the time to wash. Or the bathroom isn't warm enough to wash. Or you know what, Pastor? People who make the soap, they only after your money. That's why I don't wash. It's ridiculous. Excuses and things that people say. One day when you stand before God, you're going to hear how ridiculous you sound. Can I get a big amen there? But best we deal with it now. So let's look at the reaction of the host. He became angry, became angry. And then he said, right, now go in, go out quickly into the streets, the lanes and the city and bring in the poor, the maimed, the lame and the blind. In other words, those that were invited, if they don't want to come within your sphere of influence, in your class, your colleagues, your neighborhood, the streets around you, people that you know, relatives that you know, if they don't want to come and they've been invited, then the Bible says right now and go out. What must we do? Go out. If they don't want to come, people in your car don't want to come, still don't come alone. Bump your neighbor and say, neighbor, seriously, don't come alone. <laughs> yeah. But bump your neighbor and say, first make sure you're coming, right? Make sure you're coming. But, 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 but when you come, don't come alone. Tell your neighbor, seriously, don't come alone. So if people are not coming and, and, and whatever, he says, now go out, into the, go out to the streets and the lanes, out of your place. In other words, go to people you do not know and connect with people you do not know and connect with the poor, those that people don't in the physical world don't recognize and and, and, and go to the outcasts and those that are struggling within their lives, those that, that are not deemed as significant. The Bible says, I'm called, I've called those. Those are called to my party. Go find them, invite them, bring them along. And then the servant said in verse 22, Master, it's done as you commanded, but there's still room. Verse 23, then the master said to the servant, He said, now go out into the highways and the hedges. The highways, first of all, you've got the streets that are close to you. Then he says, okay, now, if they don't want to come or you've invited them and we haven't filled the place up, now what he says, he says, go to the highways. The highways means you're going out, completely out of your neighborhood. You're going completely out of your way. A highway takes you to a a total different place that you do not know. The Bible says, go to the highways. He says, go to the hedges. I don't know who stays in the hedges. 
But he says, go to the hedges. And he says what? He says, and compel them. Say with me, compel them. Shout out. Say with me, compel. In other words, there must be a passion and a drive to bring them and saying, come, come with me. You urge. There's an urgency about your call. Not, hey, oh, you want to come with me? Oh, you don't. Okay. No, no, no. No, there's an urgency. Why? There's a love. You understand the necessity. Because of what God has done within your life, freely I have received. Now freely we can give. And I'm driven because of what God has done for me. And that's why Paul says, he says, for the love of Christ compels me. It drives me. There's a passion in reaching the people. He says, and compel them to come in. He says, that my house may be filled. Shout it out. That my house may be filled. God wants his house filled. You see, we don't live for ourselves. We live for others. Are you hearing me? God loves all. God loves everybody. And that's why if those that are close to you and want people that you know, if they are not responding, yes, we don't give up. We minister, we pray, we help. But then the Bible says, now go to the streets, go to the streets. And people that are even looked down on and people that you don't know, people that are disrespected, um, whatever. Bible says, you see, they respected in God's eyes. Can I get a big amen there? God loves all. You go find them. Bring them to the party. Bring them to the party. And then he says, and if that doesn't happen, then you go to the highways and you go to the byways and you go to the hedges, which means it will cost you. It will cost time. Say it me, time. It will cost effort. Say it me, effort. It will cost money. Say it me, money. You've got to get in your car, you've got to drive, you've got to pick up your phone, you've got to make phone calls, you've got to touch people's lives. But that's what it means to give. That's what it means to take your eyes off yourself, that you're not about you, and look at others, those that don't know Jesus, and bring them along so that their lives can be touched and changed. And verse 24 says, For I say to you that none of those who were invited shall then taste of the supper. And I want to leave that with that today. You see, people that are hearing the word now, understand, you've been invited. You've been invited. And everybody that you touch, you're invited. One day you'll stand before God and you'll never be able to say, I was not invited. You'll never be able to say, I did not know. Are you hearing me here today? And therefore, everybody within our halls that are all over the place and online and on television, on radio, as you're listening to my voice. This is the voice of the Holy Spirit that's speaking to you. It's the voice of God that is tugging on your heart. It's the voice of God that is inviting you to the festival, to the party, to the celebration of hope, of breakthrough, hallelujah, of purpose within your life, not just mere existence, not just merely getting it by, not merely surviving. God has got a plan for your life. And he wants you to function in the original design and purpose. And we've moved away from that design. Our purpose, our heads are, our eyes are on the ground like chickens. No, it's time to lift up our heads. It's time to touch others. Bump your neighbor. Tell your neighbor, neighbor, don't miss the party. And don't come alone. Say seriously, don't come alone. Hallelujah, are you blessed? Amen. Amen. Yes. Why don't you just stand to your feet, just stay where you are. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Don't miss the party. It's a celebration. Anything we do for God, out of God, it's a celebration. God's in control of our lives. Hallelujah. If you got your names, put in your hands, close your eyes, just there where you are, become aware of the presence of God. And right now, the Holy Spirit drops some names into your heart. Right now. It might be relatives, it might be family. People that you need to touch. Hearts you need to touch. That's why I'm teaching you as a church to be outward focused. 
empty. While you're looking at yourself, you're looking at your own needs, you're looking at your, and your eyes are down. It is impossible to make good decisions because you're blind. It's like the blind following the blind. You make decisions about your marriage, about your children, but you're making it in a mode of survival as a blind man, which means the decisions you make for your children are blind. The decisions you make for your spouse are blind because you focused on your own need. But when you start focusing on others, the greatest gift you can give somebody is introducing them to Jesus. Because now God starts working within their lives. You don't have the capacity to fulfill the needs of people. That's why when we bring them to the Lord, God does a work within their lives. See, that's what takes place. Now what happens is you take your eyes off your own things. And God says, as you seek first the kingdom, His righteousness, He says, all the things you need, He will give to you. He'll add to you. So you don't have to worry about your stuff. Because as you're focused on others, God takes care of your stuff. As you look out for others and help others and bless others, God takes care of your stuff. That's how capacity grows. And that means you might be in that place where you're overwhelmed just by where you're at. And here's the thing, you're overwhelmed, you haven't even done anything in your life. How's that God's will that you be that useless? How do we serve such a big God, such an awesome God? That's not God's plan for your life. That every day we sit like fearful freaks, wondering and squabbling and trying to get by and fighting. And how's that? How's that a reflection of God? Somebody's lying. Something's wrong somewhere. But you see, when you invite God into your life and you start doing what the Bible says, and that's why today I'm doing one small thing. This small thing will have huge turnaround and results in your life because all I'm doing is I'm just getting you first, just to lift up your eyes. Just lift, lift. I'm just getting you to lift up your eyes off your own rubbish and get your eyes off yourself and just deal a little bit with that narcissism and, and, and just look and just see others. Just start there. Just start there. You see, then that starts to develop and that starts growing. And it's when your eyes are lifted, your capacity starts to increase. What happens where previous things would overwhelm you, now it becomes easy. Because you're dealing with the needs of others. So there where you are, as eyes are closed, heads are bowed, there's people that's on your heart and you know they're struggling. You know they're struggling in their lives. You know they need help. You know they need breakthrough in their lives. What I wanted to pray for now is not for yourself. We're going to pray for those people. Might be a parent. Might be your in-laws. Might be your grandchildren. Might be your children. Might be relatives. Maybe it's your colleague. Maybe it's your neighbor. The Lord is, the Holy Spirit's placing those names on your heart right now. And Lord, I pray now with each and every person right now, as you place those things within our heart, we bring them before you, Lord. We pray that, Lord, that you'll work and move within their lives, just there where you are in your mind. You give the Lord, you give the Lord the, the names. So those, say those names in your, in your mind. Give them to the Lord. 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 Thank you, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that you'll work within their hearts. Open the eyes of their understanding that they might see how much you love them, how much you care for them. And within the mess they find themselves, Lord, that you'll deliver them, that you'll set them free. You'll give them breakthrough within their lives in Jesus' name. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you will draw them according to your Holy Spirit and your power 
that you'll draw them to you, Lord, and that you'll do the work. We can't help, we can't save, we can't heal. You do the work within their lives. As we separate them, we give them over to you. And then, Lord, we pray that you also give us strategy. Strategy in how to love. Strategy in how to care. Strategy in how to show the love. Help us, Lord, to be a blessing to them, to be able to invite them, to be able to bring them to the party, to be able to bring them to you, Lord, so that their lives can be touched and changed and transformed. In Jesus' name. Give the Lord a mighty hand of praise. Thank you, Jesus. Every head bowed, every eye closed. We're going to be closing in the next few minutes. But the Holy Spirit of God is in this place, and maybe you here today, but you've not yet given your life to Jesus, which means you haven't yet come to the party yourself. And this morning, God is inviting you. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian. Having Christian parents doesn't make you a Christian. Calling yourself Christian doesn't mean you're Christian. The Bible says in John 3 verse 3, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless you are born of God, you cannot be a child of God. You can't make yourself a Christian, otherwise you're God. God needs to do the work within your life. You can be going to church your whole life and not be a Christian. You say, Bert, well, what does that mean? That's very simple. Understanding that you're not God of your life and that you need God in your life. And you come to Him, you say, Lord, here I am, a sinner. I surrender my life unto you. I give you my life. I repent from who I am. That's why He says, repent and believe. I repent, Lord, of who I am. My righteousness, my self-righteousness, being about me. No, no. Lord, I'm coming. I give you my life. You know what God will do? He'll forgive you. He'll cleanse you. He'll set you free from your past. And He'll give you a new start in your life. A new beginning. Taking out that old nature, placing His nature within you. It's a supernatural miracle that takes place. You cannot save yourself. You can maybe modify your behavior to a certain degree, but you cannot change your nature. You cannot change your heart. Only God can change you. But for that to happen, you've got to invite God into your life. You've got to submit to Him. And what God has done for me, God can do for you as well. What He's done for countless millions of others, He can do for you if you're willing to submit and give your life to Him. Therefore, while every head is bowed, every eye is closed, if that is you, and you say, I want to give my life to Jesus, maybe you've never done it before, it's your first time, or maybe you have done it before, but you're backslidden, you want to come back to the Lord. If that's you today, I'm going to count to three, quickly slip up your hand. One, two, three. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. See hands going up all over right there at the back. Thank you. And the stands, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. See those hands. Thank you. You can put those hands down. Thank you very much. I want to ask just one more time. Just one more time. Jesus says today is the day of salvation. Why does he use the word today? Today, here's the fact about today. There's people that woke up this morning that will not see the end of this day. They don't even know it yet. That's a fact of life. If you have to die today, is your life right with God? Number one. Secondly, you're in an atmosphere of faith. The word is spoken here. It's not, the, it's not the word of Bert Pretorius. It's the word of God. God is speaking to your heart. You might be, even be offended by what I'm saying, but it's not me speaking. God is speaking to your heart. And you're in an atmosphere of faith, which means it's touching your heart. But you might leave this place and never ever sense that touch again. Never sense that move in your heart, that challenge in your heart again. But one day, whether it be 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years from now, you will stand before God and He'll say, remember that day I invited you. You rejected my invitation. 
Don't let this day go by. And if I want to ask one more time, if you never raised your hand and you want to do it, quickly slip it up now. Slip it up now. One, two, three. Thank you. 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 I see those hands going up. Thank you. You can put it down. You can put it down. Awesome. Now I want to pray with you. And if you raise your hand, I'm going to ask you to do one more thing for me. I want to do a personal prayer with you. And I wonder if you can take your belongings, don't leave it on the chair. Quickly come out in the aisles and in all the venues, come stand in front quickly. Come stand there. Quickly come stand in front. frontier is not easy to publicly come make a stand the Bible says when you got faith like a mustard seed mustard seed is the small it says you'll move mountains that faith and let me tell you coming forward like this is not a small thing it's a big deal it's a big deal and that's why there's some people I want to give you another opportunity to come to the front because God wants to do a work in your life. You don't have to be shy. We've all stood here. We stood here. And we stand here often if we need to. There's nothing, it's no, nothing weird. But I need to pray with you. I need to do a prayer with you. But that's why we don't make it easy. It's a confession of your faith. It's a public stand you take. Are you hearing me here today? Maybe you got somebody next to you that you want to bring forward. Ask your neighbor, you want to go, I'll go with you, that you're not embarrassed. Just ask your neighbor. Ask them, so I'll go with you, but don't stay in your seat. Come stand here. Yes. Awesome.
bow your heads in prayer. God is not here to hold you hostage to your past. No matter what you've done, what you've gone through. Stuff we do out of fear. Things we get up to. God's not here to hold you hostage. He's here to forgive you, to set you free. Say these words to him. Say to me, dear Jesus, I need you in my life. Please forgive my sin. Take out this old nature. Everything I am, I give to you. My whole life, I surrender unto you. Thank you, Lord, that you changed me. Thank you for the gift of life, which I don't deserve. But you give it to me. I receive it according to your word I now have the right to say I am a child of God I belong to you and nothing can snatch me out of your hands Lord I pray over each and every one of these now your children every power of the devil broken over their lives right now we take authority by the blood of Jesus over their lives. Every curse broken. Every curse broken. You fill them with your love. You fill them with your peace. You fill them with your joy. Thank you, Lord. And as from now, they're your children. They belong to you. In Jesus' name, give the Lord a mighty hand of praise. Thank you, Jesus. This 3C Live experience was brought to you by the 3C Media Production. For more information, call us on 86 or log on to my3c.tv. Or you could write to us at PO Box 10508 Centurion 0046 or email us at tv at my3c.tv. If you need prayer, SMS the word PRAY followed by your prayer request to 33347 and our team of prayer warriors will pray for you for 30 days. If you would like to become a partner with the ministry, SMS the word PARTNER to 33347 and one of our team members will get back to you within the next few days. You can follow Pastors Bert and Shane Pretorius on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram to be inspired daily by morning devotions, ministry updates and much, much more. Log on to my3c.tv for more information.